Well, here we are again on number three of what is church. What we've discovered so far is that church is not a building. Church is not a place we go to, nor is church a priesthood. It's not a, a group of people that we pay to do all the work in the church. No, in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27, it says to gather you and me, you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of his body. So the church is actually us. It's a group of people with Jesus as the head, Christ as the head. What an amazing thing that this is not a picture, this is a reality. In Acts 1.1, it says the things that Jesus began to do and teach because he intended that his words and his works would continue through the body of Christ, through the church. The Bible says that he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So we are actually connected now to him. The church is not separate to Christ. We are the body of Christ. That's why there's a special sense of his presence when we get together. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers, what? To do all the work themselves? No. To equip the saints, that's you and me, the ones who've been made right with God for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So the leaders, the ministers in the church are there so that everybody does the work, so that the body itself builds itself up. As it says in Ephesians 4, verse 15 and 16, it says, from whom Jesus, the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part, every one of us, is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So the picture is of the body building up itself in love. We looked in Romans 1, 1, at this incredible verse from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. Paul knew he was an apostle. He knew he had been called to do a particular job, but fundamental to that, was that heart of service, just being available to do whatever God called him to be and to do. So the question today is, where do I fit into the body of Christ? We're going to look at this in two parts. If we look at Romans 12, we see that that beginning part is split up into three bits. First of all, verses 1 and 2, it's about the volunteers. Secondly, it's about the specialists, up to verse 8. And thirdly, um, from verses uh, 9 to verses 21, I call them GPs, general practitioners. When I was a child, if they said you're going to go to the doctor, then it would be maybe something regular that was wrong with me. But if there was something a bit tricky, the doctor, the general practitioner might say, you need to see a specialist. So there are things for all of us to do, every one of us. And there are things that are more specialist that God will lead us into in different ways. And we're going to look at that thing of being a general practitioner today. Do you remember um, a couple of years ago now it was, we talked about the stewardship of God, the parable of the talents. Matthew 25, 21, his master said to him, well done, you good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So not only is it a joyful thing to serve God, but actually in doing the simple things, the little things, God will entrust us with more. That's the way onwards. I'm going to read um, this uh, Romans 12 uh, verses 9 um, and to verse 18 in the message version. 
I've marked in blue the things which are spiritual things between us and God, our personal relationship with him, because all this flows out of us keeping close to God, reading the word, praying to God, keeping in fellowship with him, keeping right with God. It says in verse 11, don't burn out, keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert, servants of the master. So our attitude is that we want to serve him. Cheerfully expect and don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Another translation says, pray consistently. So our work in the church, uh, our service in the church comes out of our relationship with God. Then lower down it says in verse 13, help needy Christians, be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies, no cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be some great somebody. And then it says in verse 19, verse 20, our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. A few years ago, uh, Paul gave a wonderful series. It was history and new life on one another. And week after week, Paul was talking about all the verses in the New Testament about one another. And there are 47 instructions to the church which have those two words, one another. And just say a little bit about that. Of those 47, a third of them are to do with unity. Be at peace with one another. Don't grumble among one another. Be of the same mind with one another. Don't bite each other. Patiently tolerate one another. Don't complain against one another. Confess your sins to one another. So many one another things we need in normal church life. A third of them are about love, through love, serve one another, tolerate one another, and so on. And then interestingly, about 15% are about humility. Give preference to one another. That's challenging. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Serve one another. Wash one another's feet. Don't be haughty, be of the same mind to one another. Clothe yourselves in humility towards one another one another and then there are others lovely ones four times it talks about kissing interestingly enough greet one another with a holy kiss bear one another's burdens speak truth to one another don't lie to one another encourage and build up one another pray for one another I'd like to finish with Romans 12 verse 1 because actually the body of Christ is made up of volunteers. God will only use people who will willingly lay down their lives to one another. You have a decision to make. Am I going to be a consumer in the church or am I going to be a giver in the church? Sadly in many churches there are many more consumers than there are givers. But God wants us all to offer our lives to him. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. There's a picture when Elijah is with the prophets of Baal and he lays everything on the altar. He gives everything. It's a picture of us giving all to God. A burnt offering where everything was laid on the altar and the fire came down. If we as a church want the fire to come down, it's going to be as many of us offer our lives to one another. Offer our lives to God in view of God's mercy because God has been so merciful to you in particular in laying down his life in Jesus for us. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Father, we pray. We want to just offer our lives afresh to you, 
Lord, would you take our time, our talents, our gifts. Would you use them for your glory, we pray. Amen. Instead of doing questions uh, in our small groups now, we're going to look at what opportunity do we have to practice these five things, these five characteristics. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Show hospitality. Weep with those who weep. Associate with the lowly and repay no one evil for evil.